Well, good morning. We want to uh, just extend a welcome. I'm trying to think of words. I was like, I cannot get words out of my mouth to welcome you. Um, we have camp starting today, and uh, let me think. There are, I think, 15 adults from Journey Church going to help with Explorers Camp. We have 55, five, six, and seven-year-olds, quite a few from here are going as well. Um, but if you will just be in prayer for us, uh, they come today at 4, and they leave uh, Tuesday at so just be in prayer for good weather, be in prayer for all of us that we actually get a little bit of sleep um, in this. But we have amazing teenagers helping us. We have amazing adults helping us. And um, I had one mom who said, man, it's like all the Journey Church is going down there. And I said, amen. It makes my life easier. But we're excited that you are here with us today. We invite you to stand with us. We're going to do one of our favorites, Glorious Day. We're going to be doing this at camp tonight, too. So we're excited to get a little trial run through it. Uh, but sing with us as we praise our Lord and our Savior today. today. It's called This Is Our God, and it's a fairly new Phil Wickham song, and uh, Cole, who is our most recent convert for up here, 
uh, loves Phil Wickham just about as much as I do and loves his music. So we're so excited to have him uh, playing with us. But this is from Psalm 40. And Oliver, i got to get it far so I can see it. it. said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in Him. So as we're kind of learning this song, I'm sure we'll do it several times over the next couple of weeks. Um, I want you just to think about the chorus of this. It says, this is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, he redeems. And that's who we're singing about today. So sing this with us.
Let me read to you from Philippians chapter 2. It says, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're going to sing what a beautiful name and what an absolutely beautiful name it is.
And so, Father, I pray that we rest in that power today, that we rest in the strength of Jesus Christ, of him crucified, of him risen, of of him who sits at your right hand. Father, I pray that our lives will reflect that power and that the Holy Spirit will shine through us in all that we do. God, we love you so much. In your son's name we pray. Once again, and welcome, we are Journey Church. I'm Thomas, I'm the lead pastor here, and we are so thankful that you are here with us this morning. Guys, we have a couple of announcements, and then Ed, our treasurer, is going to come and kind of give us a financial update of where we are about halfway through the year. Uh, But before he comes, if you are new with us, we would love to celebrate that uh, by making a $5 donation. And all we ask is that you fill out a connection card, and you can do that right now on your phone by going to jointhejourney.church. Under I'm new, uh, there's a little form at the top. Just ask for your name and email address. Fill that out. You'll get an email back from me and just respond to that and let us know which of those organizations and charities you would like us to make that donation to. We would love to celebrate you being with us this morning. We also would love to connect with you this week. Um, Guys, uh, many of us are heading down to camp this afternoon, and so if y'all would keep us in your prayers. Uh, Lainey is the dean of uh, this uh, session of camp, and so we're going to have, I think it's five through seven-year-olds, about uh, 60 of them for the next couple of days, and so uh, keep me and Ernie in your prayers. Uh, He might pull out all his hair, um, so it's going to be rough, (laughs) Um, but keep us in your prayers, and pray also for these kids. Uh, Many of them uh, have never heard about Jesus before, and so, man, this is an opportunity for us to share Jesus not only with our words, but with our actions. Um, and and share uh, the good news of Jesus with them sometimes for the first time. Um, A couple other things. Um, Next Sunday, we're going to take up a special offering. Um, There is an organization uh, here in our community called the HEAL Program. And during the summer, uh, the HEAL Program delivers uh, fresh produce to about 40 to 50 different families throughout the county. And it costs about $1,100 a week to provide uh, that produce for volunteers to take and deliver. And they have run through all of the funding that they have for this year, and they have a couple of weeks left in the summer. They try to do it to kind of help supplement. There's a lot of families in our, in our, our county who are in desperate need of food, and especially a lot of families with kids. Uh, many of uh, our, our kids uh, don't get good meals unless they're at school um, because that's just the... the situation that a lot of uh, these families are in and so uh, this heal program really tries to help along with all the other food programs that we know that we have in our area but this is just one other area so we're going to take up a uh, special offering next week and so if you feel led to contribute to that uh, we would love love for you to join us uh, join us with that also uh, if you are looking for some opportunities to serve um, we have coastal pregnancy center uh, that is here in town, and uh, Cynthia is uh, a volunteer there. Are you part of the board as well? 
No, okay, so she just volunteers there and does a lot with the pregnancy center. But they are in need of some helpers uh, in a couple of different uh, areas. Uh, They need some people to help uh, in their store to kind of organize some of their donations of clothing and diapers and stuff like that that comes in. And then what's the other area? As a client advocate. Um, And so if you want some more information, please see Cynthia. Uh, She'd love to get you plugged in uh, to that amazing ministry that takes place in our community. All right, I think that's all the announcements I got. Ed, you're up. Good morning. I'm Ed Boland. Uh, I'm the church treasurer along with Donna. We're going to give you a quick update this morning, uh, starting with the way the offering has been running. So if we look at the average weekly offering slide, we will see that when we started our first full year, Offering averaged about $1,900 a week. The second year, it averaged about $2,000 a week. But remember, those were the COVID days. So we got through COVID. We uh, made it through COVID, came out of that in good shape, came out of that strong. And, the, and in 2022, the offering averaged 2670 This year, through the first six months, it's averaging 3138 against a budget of $2,400. And that's uh, what I've called in the past a uh, kind of a bare bones, no frills budget. And we're actually spending a little bit less than that. So if we go to the next slide, next slide you will see that the general fund building, building it started at about a little over 52000 this year, and now it's at 78000 So we're in a very good position there. The way the leadership is looking at that is that uh, if and when uh, it comes to the point where something becomes available for us, it's a, it's a place that's better suited for us, or we ha- end up having to move, which we don't see why we would. We've got some money there that we could work with that we could put with the facility contingency fund on the next slide, Ernie. We started that a while back, and we've got some money there. But if we need to move quick with the money that we now have in the general fund, plus that money together, you know, we're in a much better position to move quick. So we're well off there. And the third fund we have was the Benevolence Fund. Have some money there. So we have the General Fund, the Facility Fund, Benevolence Fund. Uh, I've got a detailed spreadsheet. There's copies in the back now on the communion table. So if you want to see by line item how we're spending against the budget, I would encourage you to take a copy of that on the way out. My purpose this morning is twofold, is to give you this financial update, but also just to thank you for everything that you're doing. It's not just about the money. Uh, If you think back to when we started, we had a few little kids in the children's ministry. Now we're to the point where it's become two groups. And so that's great. There's growth there. That requires volunteers. That requires people's time. As Thomas and Laney just mentioned, that we're going to have how many, 15 from our church at the camp this week? Helping Laney, that, that takes time. That's people giving their time, so it's not just about the money. I think I counted seven up here this morning leading us in uh, music, uh, leading us in worship and music. Uh, that's good growth. That takes time and takes talent. So everybody's giving. We really appreciate that. We're going to start uh, two new life groups in a couple of weeks, uh, middle school and high school. That takes time. It takes effort. So, again, thank you for everything that you're doing. Uh, we appreciate everything you're giving, uh, time, talent, and treasure. So uh, for me and the leadership, Thomas and the elders, uh, we appreciate everything that you're doing for us. And it's not really what we're doing. It's the way the Lord's working through us to bless the community. And we're just thankful for what he's uh, helping us do. Thank you, Ed. And uh, I just want to say thank you to uh, you and Donna uh, for keeping track of everything for us. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we try to do uh, on a pretty regular basis, at least uh, twice a year, is like like Ed just did to get up and share uh, and, and have transparency with our, our finances and things like that. And at any time, whether it's one of these Sundays that we're given a financial update or any time, please, if you have questions about anything, uh, please come up and see me or Ed or any of the elders. Uh, if you come up to see me or one of the other elders, um, we're probably going to have to turn you to Ed anyway. But, uh, you know, you can come up and ask us too, right? Because <laughs> he probably knows a little bit 
more, or actually Donna probably knows a little bit more than, uh, than everybody else. But uh, uh, any, anytime you have questions or concerns, we'd love to answer any of those things for you. And uh, as Ed said, uh, we just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, all that you guys contribute, not only your treasure, but also your time and your talent as well. Uh, we, we say often that we need each other uh, because we're better together, and that's true in every aspect of who we are as a church. Uh, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys. So I, I, from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. All right, well, let's dig in to our message today. One of our favorite movies in the Hamilton household around Christmas time is the movie A Christmas Story. And if you've seen this movie then you know the story all too well. It follows Ralphie around Christmas time. Now, Ralphie knows exactly what he wants for Christmas, an official Red Rider carbine action 200-shot range air rifle. And every time he brings it up to his mom or his teacher or even Santa Claus, they always remind him, kid, you'll shoot your eye out, right? But even with those warnings, Ralphie doesn't care. All he wants is his official Red Rider carbine action 200-shot range air rifle. So Christmas finally comes. All the gifts are handed out, and Ralphie thinks that he doesn't get his air rifle. And then his dad says, hey, what's that hiding? And there it is, wrapped up. And he unwraps it, and Ralphie runs outside, and he takes aim, and what's he do? He thinks he shot his eye out, right? He shoots the metal sign, and it comes back, and it hits him right in the face. And then he ends up breaking his glasses, and then he had to come up with a story to tell his mom, right? Oh, no, this icicle fell down. (laughs) All the time, he knew exactly what he wanted, and he didn't want to listen to anybody's warnings or advice. Today, we're going to ask the question, what do we want, not just for Christmas, But what do we want for our lives? And is what we want for our lives the same as what God wants for our lives? And we're going to see today that if what we want isn't what God wants, then we need to have a change in our priorities and a change in our life. Because living for Jesus looks to be upside down from the rest of the world. You know, oftentimes, like Ralphie, we think we know or want what is best for us, and we ignore all of the warnings and advice that we are given, and we continue to do what we think is best and what we think is right. And sadly, even in our culture today, we tell people that what they feel is what is right, right? And it's not until we come to the the hard reality that God really does know and want what is best for us, that we realize that what God has called us to, this life that he has called us to, even though it looks upside down, is really the best way for us to live our life. Because the truth is, It's not what's upside down. Everything else is. The question that we'll ask today and the question that you must answer for yourself today is the life that you want, is it the same life that God wants for you? And it starts when we meet Jesus in baptism. So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, we have some on the back table. We'd love to give you a copy of one. Please take one as a gift for from us to you. Uh, 1 Peter is almost at the very end of your Bible. If you're looking for it, it comes right after Hebrews and James and right before 2 Peter. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to pick up there in verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Read along with me. Peter says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, 
to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's pause there for just a moment. Again, I want to remind you that at the end of chapter 2, Peter has already told us that on the cross, Jesus bore our sins upon himself through his body on the cross so that we might die to sin so that we can live for righteousness. And so Peter keeps bringing us back to Jesus. Remember, Jesus is our foundation. He is our chief cornerstone on which we as living stones are being built. Jesus suffered once for sins. The death that he died, he died once for all. You and I and everyone else, we are unrighteous. We all have sinned. We all have fallen short of what God expects. You have sinned. I have sinned. All of us have sinned. And our sin pays out death. We have earned separation from God because of our sin. This is what we have earned. But Jesus has taken what we have earned on himself, and has given us what we don't deserve. This is mercy and grace of God in one act of Jesus. You see, mercy is us not getting what we deserve. That's God's mercy. He does not give us what we deserve. But because God is also just, The payment that we have earned still has to be paid. It's not like God just forgets about what we've done, but he takes what we have earned and he puts it on his son who lived the life that you and I can't, perfect, without sin. And so even though Jesus didn't deserve death, he took on death because of us. So mercy is us not getting what we deserve. But not only do we not get what we deserve, we also get what we don't deserve. And that's grace. Grace is God giving us what we have not earned. God's riches at Christ's expense. Through Jesus, not only does he take what we deserve, but then he gives us life, and forgiveness. And this happens when we put our faith in Jesus and repent of our sins and meet him in baptism. Now I want you to notice from our text here in 1 Peter 3 that baptism saves you not because of the water. It's not because you're getting a bath. Baptism saves you not because you are even doing a work. That's not how baptism saves us. Baptism saves us because of the work that Jesus has already done on our behalf. Baptism saves us because of the resurrection of Jesus, is what Peter tells us. Now, people throughout the years have disagreed about what baptism does and doesn't do. Is it a part of what God does to save us? Is it, or is it only something that we do after we are saved? And so what I want to ask you today is for you to simply look with me at the New Testament and see what the Bible says about baptism. 
Now, we're not going to read through all of these verses, but I have, uh, have them listed here, I think, on this next slide. And uh, you can take a picture of this, or you can go uh, onto our website. We actually have a digital bulletin. I don't know if you knew that or not, but we have a digital bulletin that has all of our slides that we have up here on Sunday morning. So you, you ever see a scripture like, hey, man, what was that scripture that we talked about? You can go back on our website, go to our digital bulletin, and you can pull up these verses. But they're there as well. And so we're going to kind of skim through these. We're not going to read through these, but I encourage you this week to go back and study through these verses of Scripture. Because I believe what we see in the New Testament will help reveal to us what baptism is and isn't. So Peter says here that baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus, right? So it's not, it's not a work that you are doing. You are just submitting yourself to being baptized. And baptism saves us because we are putting our faith in Jesus and repenting of our sins. And we are submitting ourselves to be baptized and to meet him in his death, burial, and resurrection. Baptism saves us because of the resurrection of Jesus. That's what Peter tells us here. In John chapter 3, that verse that's, that's up there, Jesus points Nicodemus to the truth that he has to be born again right in order for him to to see the kingdom of god he must be born not only of the water but also of the spirit in acts chapter 2 when peter preaches the first message about who jesus is uh, many in the crowd are cut to the heart and they say peter what do we do how do we respond to who jesus is we believe that he is the one that you say he is that he raised from the dead what do we do and peter says repent in the name of Jesus Christ, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people that day are baptized into Christ, res responding to who Jesus is and submitting themselves to baptism. Fast forward to Acts chapter 8, and we see Philip. He shares the good news about Jesus with the Samaritans, and including a guy named Simon who was a sorcerer. And after he shares the good news about them, uh, the, the Samaritans and even Simon respond to who Jesus is with being baptized. Then at the end of chapter 8, Philip goes and he shares the good news about Jesus with this Ethiopian who was traveling back home from Jerusalem. And he gets up in the chariot and begins to share the good news of Jesus with them. And as they're riding along, the Ethiopian looks out and he says, hey, there's some water here. What's stopping me from being baptized? And Philip's like, nothing, right? So they stop the chariot, they get out, and Philip baptizes the Ethiopian right then and there. Saul, Cornelius, uh, his whole household, Lydia, the Philippian jailer, the Corinthians, the Ephesians, every single group of people in the book of Acts who respond to the good news of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus, respond with putting their faith in Jesus repenting of their sins, and being baptized. Romans chapter 6, Paul tells us that those of us who have been baptized into Jesus have been baptized into his death, and we have been baptized into his resurrection. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul tells us, having been buried with him in baptism, in which we are also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Friends, baptism now saves us. Not because we're getting a bath. Not even because we are doing a work. Baptism saves us because in baptism we are buried with Jesus. And through baptism we are raised with Jesus to a new life. By faith. We are repenting of our sins and dying to them in baptism. And baptism is where we are raised to this new life in and through the resurrection of Jesus. So, baptism saves us. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh. It's not just because we're getting a bath. But the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves us because of the resurrection of of Jesus. It doesn't save you because of the person who's baptizing you. That doesn't matter. 
doesn't matter about the water. There's nothing special about the water. You can get baptized in the river or a pool or a bathtub or a baptistry. It doesn't matter if it's a preacher or just anybody else. They can baptize you. There's nothing special about the person who does it. It doesn't have to be a special person. In fact, all of us as followers of Jesus are called to go and make disciples. And how Jesus tells us to do that? Baptizing them and teaching them to obey. That's, that's the command for all of us. All of us are to be going out and making disciples of Jesus. And it starts when we baptize them in to Christ. Now, I know for some of you today, for the first time, you need to come and meet Jesus in baptism. For some of you, you need to take that first step today. And if that's you, or if you have questions about what that looks like, man, I would love to talk with you today. At, at the end of uh, the message, we'll, I'll be out in the lobby and would love to, to have the conversation with you. But baptism is simply where it starts. This is where this new life in Jesus begins. It starts when, by faith, we repent of our sins and meet Jesus in baptism. But this new life in Jesus doesn't stop there. It continues on for the rest of our life. And it looks upside down from the way that we used to live. And it looks upside down from the way the rest of the world lives. And so Peter starts to unpack for us what this new life, this upside-down life for Jesus looks like. Look at chapter 4 of 1 Peter, verse 1. Peter says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for the evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. You know, people who have had a near-death experience, whether it's a, a heart attack or a car accident, or, or people who have lost people who are close to them in tragic ways tend to re-examine how they live their life. They tend to re-examine what's important and what's not. There's that country song that's called Live Like You're Dying about the guy who faces his own coming death and he changes all of his priorities, right? He changes what's important and what's not in his life. Well, in the same way, someone who has suffered for the sake of the gospel, like Peter's early readers would have, they tend to have this new type of clarity for life. They tend to begin to focus on the things that are important and focus less on the things that aren't. They see more sharply the kind of world that sin produces, and they know that they are done with that way of life. They see far more that God's will is the only thing worth living for and the only thing worth following. And even though it's not pleasant to be persecuted for our faith, if we can somehow begin to see that persecution as road signs telling us that we are on the right path, it makes all the difference. If, like Jesus, we can put on this mental armor... It will help us to stay strong even in the face of suffering. You see, as Peter lays out for us, in this life, there are only two ways of living. And each of us must choose how we will live. We can continue to live for the, fl the lust of the flesh, or we can live for the will of God. We can continue to live as the rest of the world lives, or we can live upside down for Jesus. And here is what the old you and the rest of the world looks like. Look at verse 3. Peter says, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and, and detestable idolatry. 
They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the Spirit. Peter says, you have wasted enough of your life living for sin. James tells us that we don't even know what this life will have for us tomorrow. What is our life? We are but a mist, a vapor that is, appears for a little while and then vanishes away. We are here today and gone tomorrow. Our lives are like a vapor, a mist. We are only here for a short time and then we are gone. Peter says, you've wasted enough of your very short life already. Maybe you haven't taken part in all the things that Peter lists here, but maybe you have. But even if we are good people, Jesus rearranges our priorities in our lives and our values. Nothing can be gained from living this way anymore. This way of life has had enough of your time. Peter tells us that we have wasted enough of our life. Friends, I pray that you will discover that the love of God can transform your life. And not just your life, but the lives of those around you. You know, one of the hardest things about leaving your old life led to sin can be when we are around our friends who haven't left that old life. Those friends who are still living for sin. And whether it's the temptation that they bring to us to fall back into that old way of life, or it's just the fact that we are heartbroken and we want them to to come and experience the same life-transforming love of God that we have, or maybe it's even as Peter reflects here, that those people mistreat us and put us down because we're no longer running in the same circles that they are in. But friends, if we by faith have repented of our sins and met Jesus in baptism, our old life is dead. It, It doesn't rule us anymore. Now oftentimes we end up responding to that pressure that we get from our friends who are still living for sin, either by giving in and sinning right along with them, or we respond to that pressure by isolation and cutting those people off from our life altogether. But I believe that this pressure instead should move us to be a witness for Jesus to them. In fact, here at Journey Church, we say that all of us go out and build authentic relationships with the lost in our community and around the world to communicate the gospel of Jesus to them. You see, it's through these authentic relationships that we have with people and for them not only seeing the transformation that is taking place in our life, but also hearing from our words the good news of Jesus, that God opens up opportunities for those people to hear about Jesus and to have the same transformation that we have. Now, there will be times when, like Joseph, that temptation is too much and we need to flee. Right? That does need to be our response. But that doesn't need to be our only response. I believe through the strength of God, not giving in to sin, but also not running away from those relationships, instead, we can set an example for them. But it's only through the strength that God provides through His Holy Spirit in our lives. 
And it's only through those authentic relationships with those who are lost that we will be able to share the good news of Jesus with them. But if, when that pressure comes, all we do is give in and sin, then we won't have those opportunities to be a witness for Jesus. Or, if when those pressures come, we push those people away, we also won't have those opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with them. I believe that when we build authentic relationships with the lost, that God will open up opportunities for us to share the gospel of Jesus. So, when we live for the lust of this world, or will we begin to live for the will of God? Will we continue to waste this short life that we have and live as the old us, or will we begin to live upside down for Jesus and use the opportunities that God provides for us to be his witnesses to those who are far from him. Peter begins to lay out for us what this new life in Jesus looks like, what this life that is upside down for Jesus looks like in verse 7. Read along with me. He says, The end is near of all things. Excuse me. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins offer hospitality to one another without grumbling so peter reminds us here that the end of all things is near and it's true jesus is going to return now will that happen Today or tomorrow or another 2,000 years from now, I don't know. But what I do know is that Jesus has ushered in a new way of living. He has put an end to our old way of living, to our old selves living for sin. And he has ushered in a new way for us to live for righteousness, for God. But Jesus will return. And as the old hymn says, maybe it'll be morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. But Jesus is coming again. But not only is he coming again, but he also has set an example for us in how we are to live here and now until he returns. This is how this new life in him should look. This is how this life that is upside down from the rest of the world should lurk. It, look, it starts with us being alert and being of sober mind for the purpose of prayer. Peter is telling us here that we should be of a right mind. Paul will use the same word in a couple of different places in his letters. In 2 Corinthians 5.13, he uses this, this word of being uh, sober of mind in contrast to being mad or being crazy. Or in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, he uses it uh, in contrast to us thinking too highly of ourselves, of us being arrogant and prideful. He says, be of sober mind. Be alert and of sober mind. Friends, prayer helps us to have a clear mind, a sober mind mind. Prayer is vital for us to overcome fear and to overcome arrogance. In prayer, we find the courage, even in the face of fire for our faith, to remain faithful to Jesus. In prayer, we find clarity of thinking. Peter says, be alert and be sober-minded. And third, he says, Love one another deeply. Again, this is another theme that we see all throughout Peter's letter, right? For us to love one another. We've seen in 1 John that if we love God, then we will also love one another. 
The Greek word here that Peter uses for deeply literally means stretched out. Much like an athlete will stretch out to make a play. You see, love isn't always easy. Love isn't always comfortable. Love isn't always our natural response to one another. It often requires persistent effort. Love stretches us. As Carl Kuhl says, if we want close relationships, we will get hurt. But it's worth it. Friends, we are to love one another tirelessly, earnestly, deeply. And this love will not be easy. It will stretch us. We must love one another deeply and be willing to risk getting hurt and be willing to sacrifice to put their needs over our own. This kind of love is far more than just an emotional feeling. This kind of love is loving them even when we don't want to. This kind of love is loving them even when they don't deserve it. This kind of love loves them no matter what it may cost us. This love covers over a multitude of sins. Not that it tries to hide sin or actually to cover them up, but rather love, when we love one another deeply, is a gift of forgiveness of sins, is what Peter is telling us. So he says, be alert, be of sober mind, love one another deeply. And finally, he says, be hospitable without complaint. Now, Peter isn't just saying, hey, don't complain when your in-laws are in the, in the house, right? That's not what Peter's saying here, right? He's saying, but, but may your home be a hospital for the hurting and the needy. That's what he means by being hospitable. That, that your home would be a hospital for the hurting and the needy. There's a family that showed me what this looks like in real life. The Steins family. Both Homer and Peggy Steins and Homer's brother, Melvin and Dorothy, who have now passed on, they showed me and my family and so many others what hospitality looks like. They, they showed me what it looked like for their home to be a hospital for the hurting and the needy. And I can't tell you how many meals, how many Christmases, when my grandparents lived in Florida and in California, how many Christmases we spent with their family opening up gifts. I, I can't tell you how many, how many holidays and summer vacations we spent in their home. And, and we were just one of many families that the Steins showed this type of hospitality to. Their home was a hospital for the hurting and the needy. Friends, if we live upside down for Jesus, if we choose to live for the will of God, we will be alert and of sober mind. We will love one another deeply. We will be hospitable without complaint. And then finally, we will use the gifts that we have been given to serve other people and to glorify God. Look at verse 10. Peter continues, and he says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides. Let's pause there. You know, oftentimes here at Journey Church, we say that we serve each other, we serve the church, we serve God by giving of our time, our talents, and our treasures. We have already talked about that this morning. But each of us has been created uniquely by God, and we have been gifted specifically by the Holy Spirit when, through baptism, we are not only forgiven of our sins, but we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we are to use, we have been entrusted those gifts 
to steward. Now, that's not a word we use, right, except in the church. <laughs> in our culture, we don't go around and say, hey, uh, you're going to be a steward of this time and these resources, right? We probably use more something like manager, right? We, we hire a manager to manage uh, your business, right? To manage your employees, to manage your resources, right? That's what steward means. God has entrusted us, whether we're talking about our treasure, our money, it's God's, it's not ours, it's his, and we are to manage it his way. God has given us our talents and our gifts, and we are to manage them for him. We are to steward them for him. We have been gifted through creation and through baptism by the Holy Spirit to glorify God and to serve others with the gifts and the time and the energy that we have, both within the church and outside the church. Let me give you some examples. Maybe you have been gifted with kids. Well, man, we have some opportunities for you to use those gifts within the church. Volunteer in our kids' ministry, as many, as many of you already do. Volunteer in our middle school or high school life groups that we're getting ready to start. Use those gifts that God has given you within the church. But I would say that we also need to serve others outside of the church. And so if you've been give, given the gift uh, with kids, maybe start mentoring uh, at, at, at one of our schools with kids who are there. Maybe start uh, substitute teaching in our community. Maybe start coaching a kid's ball team. Use the gifts that God has given you to serve others within the church and outside the church. Maybe you have the gift of music or singing. And we have a great opportunity for you to use that gift within the church to help lead us in music. But we can use that gift outside of the church as well. Man, maybe find opportunities to go and play and sing music at nursing homes or in our schools. I, I know people who play in bands who aren't Christian bands, but use their talents as an opportunity to build relationships with people who are far from Jesus, not only in the rest of their band, but also the people that they get to go and play to. And through their example and through their words, they get to be a witness. Use your talents to serve others and to glorify God. Maybe you have been gifted with hospitality. Why not join our welcome team and help people feel welcome when they come to gather on Sunday mornings? Or maybe you can invite that hurting coworker or neighbor into your home for dinner. Or maybe you can open up your home and host a life group. Maybe you have been gifted with the ability to build or to repair things. Maybe you can use your gifts to serve that neighbor who needs that house repair or that wall painted or that car fixed. Maybe you've been gifted with numbers and budgets. Maybe you can offer to help that coworker or that friend who's struggling with theirs. Maybe you're a gifted counselor. Maybe God has given, given you the ability to, to be able to really listen to people that are hurting. Reach out to those who are hurting and take time to listen to them. Whatever your gift or your talents are, use them to serve others both within the church and outside of the church. And if you're looking for areas to serve within the church, you can go to our website at jointhejourney.church under volunteer sign-up. And we have a whole list of things every single Sunday that you can get involved in. We've mentioned already this morning some opportunities outside of the church, whether it's at the Pregnancy Center or at the Purpose of God Ministries or down at the camp or Eagle's Wings, there are, are so many amazing organizations right here in our community where you can get plugged in and you can use the gifts that God has given you to serve others. But then Peter, as we close out, reminds us of why. Why we use our gifts to serve others. Why do we live upside down for Jesus? Look again at verse 11 at the end of that. 
And Peter says, So that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Everything that we do in this new life in Jesus is to give glory to God. In everything you do, may God be glorified. In you using your gifts to serve others, may God be glorified and praised. In your hospitality, may God be glorified. Here at Journey Church, We value this so much that it's one of our values. We say this, that we want to live lives that are pleasing to God. And what we mean by that is that all of us, every single day, not just on Sundays, but every day, give the best of everything that we are and everything that we have to God. And we do that because we're trusting that Jesus is all that we need. And we do that because Jesus is transforming us by what he has done and who he is. But the question that each of us will have to answer is what will we choose today? Will we choose to continue to live as our old self and continue to live for sin, continue to live for the lust of the flesh, Or will we start living upside down for Jesus? And that happens when we are alert in our sober mind, when we love one another deeply, when we are hospitable without complaint, when we serve others with our gifts, and when we live to give glory to God. So what will you choose today? Will you choose to continue to live and waste this short life that you have to live for sin? Or will you live for the will of God? Be sober. Be alert. Love one another deeply. Be hospitable. Find out how God has gifted you and use it for His glory. Today, Journey Church, let's commit right here and now, to live upside down for Jesus. Friends, maybe today, though, your old life is your current life. And maybe today you need to come and put your faith in Jesus and repent of your sins and be saved through baptism. Not because you're going to get a bath, but because you're going to be pledging yourselves to God for a clear conscience. Maybe you need to come and be saved by the resurrection of Jesus today so that the mercy and the grace of God can cover your old life of sin and so that you can start living upside down for him today. We pray with me? Father, we thank you for the example of your son Jesus. We thank you that he put on that mental armor so that he could live for your glory so that he could live that perfect life that we can't, and so that he could sacrifice himself for our need. We thank you that in that one act on the cross of him giving his life, not only has he given us your mercy by by taking away what we deserve, but he also has given us your grace by giving us what we don't deserve, forgiveness and love and life. Father, if there are those that are here this morning who are far from you, would you draw them to yourself today? Would you show them what it means to, for them to surrender their life led to sin to you? For those of us who already have, would you constantly remind us of our need for you? Would you help us to submit our, our entire lives and everything that we are over to you for your glory, for your praise? Father, help us to live lives that are pleasing to you. And help us to be your witnesses to our friends who are far from you. 
Father, sometimes that's not easy. We can only do it with your strength, with your wisdom. So would you give us the strength and the words to share with them the good news of your Son? We thank you for this reminder that we are, as your people, are getting ready to partake in of communion to help remind us of the sacrifice that your Son Jesus has made on our behalf. Father, we thank you because we are forgetful and need to be reminded. We thank you for this time that we can come and commune with you and with each other. We can testify with our actions together that we believe that your Son, Jesus, is the Messiah. And that we believe not only in his death, but also in his resurrection. So Father, help us to proclaim that here today. Father, we ask all of this in his precious name. Amen. Friends, we are going to move into our time of communion. And if you're a follower of Jesus, this is a time for us to remember the sacrifice that Jesus has made on our behalf. And if you didn't grab communion on your way in, you can raise your hand. I think I saw Taylor back in the back. He can bring you uh, communion right there to you at your seat. But communion for us as followers of Jesus reminds us of Jesus' body through the bread and his blood through the cup. New Testament tells us that when we partake, that we should use this time to examine ourselves, to confess our sins to God, to make sure that when we do partake, that we are partaking in a worthy manner that brings honor to God. So do that now. Reflect on your life. Confess your sins to God. And when you're ready, let's remember and let's proclaim together the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. If you're here and you want to talk about what it means to follow Jesus, or you just want somebody to pray with you, I'm going to be out in the lobby. Come, let's talk today. When you're ready, let's remember. that you stand with today as we close out. We're going to close out today with you are my all in all.
you all for joining us this Sunday. I hope everyone has a great week.